time to begin our service this evening. I think tonight is question and answers. So if you've submitted some questions, maybe Luke will get to them tonight. If not, week after next, I believe, he will finish up. Because next week we have Daniel Goshorn coming in to address us about the work that he has going on in Peru. So uh, I'm sure that him and his wife has had some situations over there and uh, their children. So kind of looking forward to hearing what's going on in that part of the country. We mentioned those that were sick this morning. We mentioned that uh, Ruth, and she's still home with back problems. And Fran, she's, uh, she's got some back problems also. And then Janethel, they went out and visited with her. and She was doing better waiting on doctor's appointments. And we mentioned this morning that the service for the Janetta Farrell family will be tomorrow around noon at, uh, I think it's the First Baptist Church down here in Canova. Uh, Cerrito. 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 So uh, if uh, they were very close to the Ledbetters, so uh, I want you to remember them in our prayers. And Anna Lee Bennett, which is Jonathan and Ashley's little daughter, I want you to remember her. She's uh, She's been battling with some UTI problems since she was just uh, almost born. They hope that she'll grow out of it, but at this time she's still struggling with it. So, And we want to remember our cheer baskets in the back, back there, one for a male, one for a female. And if you want to donate things to that, you're more than welcome to. And Gina said that uh, the ladies are planning to attend several ladies' days in spring. March 2nd at Rao Grande and April 20th at Alkair in Columbus. And you can talk to her about de details on those trips as they get closer. And also, uh, the, they took up a basket of cheer. And Gina, and I don't know if any of the ladies went with her or not, but they went out to see Christy and took it to her before she took the downturn with her problems. Uh, I haven't heard anything about her today, but uh, we know that uh, according to what I can gather, that she did turn septic and uh, she's had some, some major problems. But Gina said that she was uh, really enjoyed the, the visit and she's really appreciative of the things that the ladies and everyone sent out for her. So uh, it's a good work, you know, and I'm sure people around there saw what was going on the uh, the workers and she probably told them where it came from so to glad god be the glory that is all i have this time so brother bill's going to lead us our singing so everyone grab a songbook please let's begin this evening with number 178 number 178 In vain, in high and holy lays my soul, a grateful voice would raise. Or who can sing the worthy praise of the wonderful love of Jesus? Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. A joy by day, a peace by night, in storms a calm, in darkness light, in pain a balm, in weakness might is the wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. My hope for pardon, <coughs> my trust. For lifting when I fall in life 
in death my all in all is the wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. Number 550. 550. After this hymn, we'll be led in prayer. Shackled by a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and shame, then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. He touched me, oh, he touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened and now I know he touched me and made me whole. Since I met this blessed Savior, since he cleansed and made me whole, I will ever cease to praise Him. I'll shout it while eternity rolls. He touched me, oh, He touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know He touched me and made me bow with me please <clears throat> Father in heaven humbly we approach thy throne of grace this evening Heavenly Father thanking you for all the wonderful blessings that you bestow on us we know Heavenly Father that every good and perfect gift comes from you especially Heavenly Father we want to thank you for Jesus that you sent here to the earth to suffer and die for our sins on the cross Heavenly Father we have many sick in our number We've mentioned a lot of them today in, in, our, in our announcements. We ask Heavenly Father that you give each one of them a special blessing and be with the, the caregivers and the doctors and the nurses who are, are taking care of them. Give them the wisdom and the ability to heal them and allow them to come back in a, in a, and be with us if possible. And whatever and all things, Heavenly Father, thy will be done. Heavenly Father, we pray for the leaders of our country. We pray for our local leaders. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will give them wisdom, that they will lead us well, and to seek your guidance when, when times are, are in all times. Heavenly Father, we pray for Brother Luke as he stands before us. We ask you to give him a recollection of the things that he has studied. Help him to deliver these things to us in a way that we can be better Christians in, in thy sight and that we may be a, a beacon to the, to the world and that we can be good servants in thy sight. Last of all, Heavenly Father, we ask you to forgive us when we fall short of thy glory. And as we repent of our sins, please forgive them. And in the end, Heavenly Father, for found worthy, 
Give us a home with thee forever. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. <clears throat>
Hadean realm. I think we'll know the reason why on Judgment Day. And it says in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse number 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I think about Jesus saying, I never knew you. First John, oh, chapter, I think chapter two or three says, by this we know him if we keep his commandments. These people, Jesus didn't know them because they did not keep his commandments. They'd done some good things. They'd done some charitable deeds. They allegedly performed many miracles, which were told in Matthew chapter 24 that there would be people to come that would show great signs and wonders that would deceive, even if it were possible, the very elect. So whether or not these were actual miracles, we don't really know. But these people were doing some good things, but they weren't following God's law completely. That is the New Testament law. And so these people, Jesus would tell them, you practice lawlessness. So on this judgment scene, they know the reason why, because they disobeyed God. But then we get into more specific things in Matthew chapter 25. Here is this judgment scene. We have a judgment scene in Matthew chapter 25. In Matthew chapter 25, here's more specifically, um, people are told a reason why they're not going to uh, be rewarded um, in a good sense. It says in Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse number 41, Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41, here's this judgment scene where Jesus comes in his glory, all the angels with him, and uh, he sits. they sit on his glorious throne, and he is separating people left and right. He rewards those who are good and says, you've done good, um, you, you've done uh, the good things, you've clothed the naked, you've given drink to the thirsty, you've given food to the hungry, you visited those in prison, and so you'll be rewarded. But then it says in verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they say also, uh, then they themselves will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? And then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So here's this judgment scene, and here are these people asking God, well, what did we did do wrong? And here they are told exactly what they did wrong. One other passage, and here's an individual who was told exactly what he did wrong. In Luke chapter 12, and you know what, I take back what I said. Actually, I just changed my mind. It happens sometimes. The Spirit moved me. I'm just kidding. Um, in Luke chapter 16, here's a man who is in the Hadean realm and told exactly why he's there. So we, I guess we will know why we're there. Um, at least this man did. In Luke chapter 16 and verse 19, um, you don't want to get into my brain. You would get really confused quickly. In Luke chapter 16, it says oh, in verse 19, um, I'm just going to uh, paraphrase some of this. But here is this rich man, and here is Lazarus. Lazarus is sitting outside the rich man's gate, and the rich man walks by him every day. And, and here's Lazarus begging to even have some crumbs. He's got sores. The dogs are licking the sores, and he just wants a crumb from the master's table. Maybe it's his old master. Maybe it is his master. We don't know exactly what the relationship is between Lazarus and the rich man. But we know the rich man just looks by him every day and doesn't do a thing for Lazarus, doesn't take care of him. And so both die. The rich man dies rich, wakes up poor. The poor man dies poor and wakes up rich. And here is one man in Abraham's bosom, verse 22 says. Jesus would call this paradise. And here it says the rich man, verse 33, in Hades, he lifted up his eyes. In the same place, the broad place as uh, Lazarus, but on a different side, it says he was being in torment. 
Mary sees Abraham and Lazarus afar off, and he's wanting help. He's wanting Abraham to help him. And he says in verse 25, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. So here, here is a man in the Hadean realm told what, exactly why he's there. Well, I followed the Sabbath, Lord. I paid my tithing. I, I, uh, I invited guests over to my house, and I was hospitable, and, and I did... Yeah, but you had a rich, man, a poor man right there, right in front of you, and it didn't take care of him. And so here is a man. Now, I don't know if that's what the rich man did, but I could hear somebody like that making excuses. And here we have a sense where a man is told exactly what he did wrong. So to basically answer the question, yes, they will know the reason why. Um, there are going to be good people in hell, people that did good things, people that attended some sort of church, but they did not follow the will of God. They were misled, and it's their fault. I mean, false teachers, they are responsible for what they teach, but we're also responsible for what we hear and listen to. Passages all over the place about test the spirits, uh, test all things, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, search the Scriptures daily to see whether the things that are being told to you are so. And so we have a responsibility. And so, yes, they will know the reason why. Question number two. Um, will there be degrees of punishment in hell and degrees of reward in heaven? I'm going to start with the wrong place to go. Let's look at Matthew chapter 20. A lot of people go to Matthew chapter 20 for the answer, for reward, for reward in heaven. But we need to understand Matthew 20 is actually not about the end times. Matthew chapter 20 says nothing about the end times, says nothing about um, uh, eternal punishment, says nothing about um, anything like that. In Matthew chapter 20, it says, For the kingdom of heaven... What's the kingdom of heaven? What is the kingdom that Jesus was preaching? The church. The church is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. This is what the church is like. When he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, it's uh, equal to about a day's wages there, um, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. And so they went. Again he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day long? And they said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. When those hired about the eleventh hour came, each one received a denarius. When those, hired, those who were hired first came, they thought also that they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and scorching the heat of the day. Now I want you to stop right there and think about the Jews. The Jews were giving, given the law of Moses. They brought Jesus into the world. They had to build the temple. They had to do all the sacrifices. They had... They bore the heat of the day. And here are these Gentiles getting the same gospel as they are. But he answered and said to them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go. But I wish to give to this last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last, last shall be first and the first last. Now, we know this isn't about the end times because, number one, he mentions the kingdom of heaven. That's the church. Secondly, there is no clue here about eternal reward, eternal punishment, weeping and gnashing of teeth, um, eternal fire, nothing like that. Second of all, here are these people, if this were heaven, here are these people in heaven grumbling about the Gentiles being in heaven with them. Well, will God allow grumblers into heaven and complainers? Well, no. So th this is nothing about that. This, these are... This is a, uh, a parable about the Jews and the Gentiles. God would bring the, Gentile, uh, the Gentiles into the church last, Acts chapter 10, and they received the same gospel as the Jews did. The Jews didn't like that. In fact, we'll see that this parable comes to pass in the book of Acts. 
And so this is about the church and the gospel going to Jews and then to Gentiles and all receiving the same gospel message. The text that we could go to, some go to, is Luke chapter 19. Um, I used to go to passages like this, but we need to understand context very well. Turn with me to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. <clears throat> Luke chapter 19 and verse 11. This text is often used to say that there are degrees of reward. I'm going to present this to you and then we'll prove it, that this is not about eternal rewards in heaven. Because context is very important. Why does Jesus give this parable? Well, look in verse 11. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable. Because He was near Jerusalem, and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. Remember, uh, it's also in Luke where there were these people who thought the kingdom of God should appear, and He says, oh, don't, they'll, they won't say, see here and see there about the kingdom, for behold, it doesn't come with observation, for the kingdom of heaven is where within you. So he's telling them the church is a spiritual thing. It's not a physical kingdom. The kingdom that Daniel saw and all that, it's not a physical kingdom. It's within you. It's in your heart. It's in a spiritual thing. So here, this parable is about the church, the kingdom of God. And so he said a nobleman, the nobleman here stands for Christ, went into a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself. This is him receiving the church and then return. We, everybody likes to look at the word return and think, oh, second coming. Jesus came on AD 70. Jesus came. There was a coming of the Lord when Rome was destroyed. Coming of the Lord doesn't always mean end times. Look at Isaiah chapter 13. Look at Isaiah chapter 19 where God rode upon a swift cloud into Egypt. He came into Egypt and destroyed it. Well, not literally, just language. So we need to understand the return doesn't simply mean a second coming. And he called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minas. Now here this is about money. Ten minas. Uh, and it was about equal to a hundred days wages and said to them, do business with this until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. And when he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that the slave get that when he returned after receiving the kingdom, not when he returned and gave up the kingdom. First Corinthians 15 says on the day of judgment, when he returns, he's going to deliver up the kingdom. Here he says he returns after receiving the kingdom. So nothing about end times. And he says he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared and saying, Master, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said, Well done, good slave. Because you've been faithful in a very little, you are to be in authority over ten cities. The second came saying, Your mina, Master, has made five minas. And he said to him also, And you are to be over five cities. Another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you are an exacting man, and you take up what you did not lay down, and reap what you did not sow. Verse 22, he said to him, By your own words I will judge you, you worthless slave. Did you know that I am an exacting man, taking up what I did not lay down, and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not put my money in the bank, and having come, I would have collected it with interest? Then he said to the bystanders, Take the mina away and give, uh, from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And he said to him, Master, he has ten minas already. Now here is the uh, text. I tell you that to everyone who has, more shall be given. Has what? Responsibility. The, the one who has the biggest responsibility, the most money, shall be given what? More shall be given what? More responsibility. You, you, you get a lot, you're going to have have more responsibility in the church. Remember, the context is about the kingdom of God, the church. And if you have responsibility over ten minas, God's going to give you responsibility over even more. And then he says, but the one who does not have, even what he has, does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine who do not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Again, just because there's Jesus destroying his enemies, it's not always about end times. We have to understand context very well. So this is not about end time. Nothing about eternal rewards. Nothing about 
entering into heaven. Nothing is set. All of it's about is they think it's a physical kingdom and he has to correct them on their responsibilities. The responsibility is you're going to be given a responsibility for some things. Some will be given more money. Some will be given less money. And what do you have? The amount of responsibility given back to you will be equal to what you have done. So nothing about eternal reward. Again, it just doesn't seem to make sense. Oh, you've been faithful with the abilities you have spiritually, and you're a stronger Christian, and you're a weaker Christian, but both of you gave it your best, and you're going to have more eternal life than this guy. It just doesn't seem fit with the nature of God. God doesn't show partiality. God doesn't look at one better than the other, so it just doesn't seem to make sense in heaven that one will receive a, what, a bigger mansion than another or something. It just it just doesn't seem to fit with the nature of God. And this text is simply just not a good one to use. Um, if there are, if there were degrees of reward in heaven, okay, cool. I don't really care. <laughs> I just want to be there. Don't you? I just want to be there. Um, that's what we need to really understand. And Deuteronomy 29, 29 tells us the secret things belong to God, but he has made known to us the things that we need to know. What about the degrees of punishment? Now let's look at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Now this is in a context of punishment. Luke chapter 12. Uh, beginning in verse 42. Now here's in this context of being ready for the coming of the Lord. And um, we go here to uh, verse number 42. And it says this, Who then is the faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their, relation, uh, their rations at the proper time. Blessed is that save, slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that slave says in his heart, my master will be a long time in coming and begins to beat the slaves, both men and women, and eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and in an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. And that slave who, get this, the slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accordance with his will will receive many lashes. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. For everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much of him they will ask the more. Now, some of this context is about responsibility, but here punishment is mentioned. Those who know better are going to be punished more than those who don't know better. So this context seems to tell us that there is, in judgment, that is, by God, a degree of punishment. And that seems to make a lot of sense with the nature of God. God is fair. God is just. If somebody doesn't know something, well, I didn't know baptism was for the remission of sins. Well, that doesn't mean you can go to heaven, but I think the guy who knew better is going to be punished a lot more than the one that didn't know better. The Bible says, He that believes and baptized shall be saved. John 3 and verse 5 says, No man can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and of the Spirit. So we can't just slide right on in and cl claim that we were ignorant of it. But it seems like in this context, ignorance um, will be punished less than people who know better. Another text we want to look at is James chapter 3 and verse number 3. James chapter 3 and verse number 3. James chapter 3 and verse number 3. Oh, I have James chapter 3. I meant verse 1. Um, can't read my own notes. James chapter 3 and verse 1. Now, I don't know what kind of judgment is in mind here that James mentions. It could be uh, the standard from the world. If you are a teacher, you are in a, on a stricter, you're on a higher plane in people's eyes. Not in God's eyes. When you're a teacher, God doesn't exalt you above everybody else. And you shouldn't feel that way in your own mind, that you're a teacher of God's Word. But once you become a teacher of God's Word, once you become known to people, they do put you on a pedestal. It's just, that's how it is. I, I don't like it. I hate it that it's like that. 
because I'm just a man and I sin and I mess up. But we do receive a, res a higher standard from people. So I don't know exactly if this is about um, f uh, judgment from God or judgment from man. Or here's the case, it could be both. And I think that's probably the way we ought to go with it since there's not a, uh, uh, an ad identifier of what judgment is. And he says, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. And so whether it's God or man, if it, it's God and it probably is too, God will judge us even more when we are teachers. If we teach false doctrine, we are going to get a lot more punishment than those who are misled. And that's, that's certainly true uh, throughout other scriptures. We need to make sure we know what we're teaching and, and be well studied. One more passage I want to look at is Hebrews chapter 10. If you back up to Hebrews chapter 10, this is about a Christian walking away from God. This isn't about someone who never obeyed the gospel. Question, if somebody, an accountable person, never obeys the gospel, will they receive eternal punishment? Yes, 2 Thessalonians says those who did not obey God or know God shall be punished with an everlasting destruction. But it's going to be a lot worse, according to the text that we're about to read, if those of us who obey the gospel know better, and don't just make mistakes, but sin willfully, keep on going. It's a continual action kind of lifestyle. We keep sinning. We, in this context, it's forsaking the assembly, but we can broaden that to any rebellious sin, though. If we just keep on leaving God and, and just don't come back to Him, it says in verse 26, For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. adversaries. Um, verse number 29 says, How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled under the foot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? These are people who were sanctified. These are Christians and has insulted the Spirit of grace. And then verse 31 tells us it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is terrifying to fall into the hands of the living God if you're not a Christian. But if you are a Christian and then you walk away from all the grace that you've received and the forgiveness that you received and you never come back to Him, it's going to be even more terrifying. So it seems like the Scriptures pretty clearly teach us there are going to be just, uh, degrees of uh, punishment. There's a difference between Adolf Hitler and maybe a young boy who recently obeys the gospel and or a, a boy who not obeys the gospel but maybe a young boy or girl who reaches the age of accountability and maybe a couple days later a few days later dies without obeying the gospel i think there's a huge difference between people like that not that both are going to be in hell because they were accountable and they didn't do the responsible things they should do but it seems like with god's nature there's a big difference between men like adolf hitler and, and Joseph Stalin than just somebody who hasn't obeyed the gospel yet. So um, in hell, it seems like yes. In heaven, it seems like no. I, I'm not seeing it anywhere in God's word if, if there are pointed out to me, but it just doesn't, doesn't look like our God is like that. Um, let's see. We have probably time for one more question. If God doesn't, this was asked in Bible class a while back, and Kevin had asked if I could probably do it, so I, I will. If God doesn't tempt us, um, what does? Why did Jesus tell us to pray? Do not lead us into temptation. Now this comes from Matthew chapter six and verse thirteen. If you go ahead and turn there, Matthew chapter six and verse thirteen, we're told to pray different things. Matthew chapter six and verse thirteen. There are some things that God's going to do, whether we ask for it or not. Um, we're told to pray uh, that His kingdom come. Does He need us to pray that His kingdom come? No, He don't need us to do that. Uh, he wants us to pray, Your will be done. Well, is His will going to be done no matter what we do? Yeah. Uh, he wants us to pray uh, our daily bread to be given to us. Now that one, I could you could probably argue that if you're not depending upon God for your daily needs, you may not receive them. But still, I neglect this prayer a lot. I do. I, I'm trying to work better on it. And here God still is blessing me. 
I think it's a lot of mercy and grace shown to me that God's given me the blessings I need. So God necess- doesn't necessarily need me to ask Him this thing. He asks us to pray uh, to forgive our debts because we also forgive our debtors. Now that one we have to do. The Bible says if you don't confess your sins, He won't forgive you. That's in First John. So some of this God doesn't need us to pray for. Other things He does want us to pray for. Here in verse 13, He says, And do not lead us into temptation, but Deliver us from evil. Now the first question we need to ask then is what temptation is he talking about? He could be talking about simple trials. Um, uh, James chapter 1 and verse uh, uh, 2 talks about various trials that will come upon us. Nothing about temptation to sin. Nothing about enticement to sin. So maybe that's what he's talking about. Maybe he's talking about that. But it doesn't seem like that's the way we ought to go with it because the very next phrase says, but deliver us from evil. Keep us from sinning is exactly what he's telling us. So if God doesn't tempt us, that's James 1.13. God can't be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt any man. And yet here we've got Jesus telling us to pray, don't lead us into temptation. Well, we need to understand first that Satan does all the tempting. It's always Satan. Anytime we get tempted to sin... Satan is doing it. But we also need to understand that God allows us to be tempted. He does. In fact, if you look at Job chapter 1 and 2, combined with 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Job says, I want to get Satan. Or uh, Satan says, God, I bet you anything I can get Job to curse you to your face. I bet I can tempt him to sin, God. I bet I can get him to get away from you and to leave you and to be unfaithful to you. And God says, Go ahead and try it, buddy. Good luck. And so Job tries it, or Satan tries it, never happens. Job sticks to God. Yeah, he says a couple of things that aren't so good. He, he, he boasts about wisdom and uh, justifies himself and tries to do a couple of things, but he never curses God to his face. He never walks away from God. So, yes, God does allow us to be tempted, but you remember what God told Satan? Listen, you can do this and you can do that, but wait for this, or don't do this. The first time he told him, don't do nothing but this. And then later on you tell him, you can do this and that, but don't take his life. God was giving Satan limits, saying, look, I'll allow you to do some things, but you are on a chain. Remember this. And that's exactly what 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells us, that God will not allow Satan to tempt us with some sort of sin that we cannot handle to overcome. So we need to understand that. But look at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. Notice how Jesus ended up being tempted. It was by the devil. He was tempted by the devil. That's what the text literally says. Not God. But look at verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit. Who's the Spirit? God. Led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be what? To be tempted by the devil. So God was leading Jesus into this temptation. God does, in a sense, lead us into temptation. He does allow us to be led into temptation, but He never tempts us. And so basically what we're praying for in this text then is that God will help us and and be faithful to His promise that He won't lead us into the temptation that we can't handle, that we can't overcome. And obviously, is God going to be faithful to us regardless of whether or not we ask Him? He is. But I think a lot of the things that he's telling us to pray for in this text is for our benefit. Getting us to start depending upon God. God doesn't need us to pray for His will to be done, but He wants us to let His will be done. He wants us to have His will above our own will. And when we pray that, it's more for our benefit than His. When we pray for God to give us our daily bread, He doesn't need us to do that. It's for us to learn how to be poor in spirit, to be completely dependable upon God. And I think in this context, God's never going to lead us into temptation we cannot handle and let Satan tempt us with something we can't handle. But he wants us to pray to him for this because we want uh, he wants us to depend upon him. And so what does it mean simply do not lead us into temptation? It's just simply asking God to be in harmony with his nature, to, to help us and take care of us even when Satan does tempt us. Um, I don't think we have time to do any more tonight. Next week, uh, or next a couple of weeks from now, we'll do uh, uh, the next few questions. Don't know if we're going to finish all these, so if we don't finish all these by that next Sunday, 
Um, I could either keep going or I might put it off a month so we don't just do question and answers every Sunday night. Um, so uh, that's it. We're going to skip these next few questions because there's a lot and there's a lot to talk about in them. But the most important question that we need to ask is how do I get to heaven? Or what must I do to be saved? Well, I think most of us here are saved. We're on the way to heaven. But we're also told, as we read earlier in Hebrews chapter 10, that our eternal destination can be taken away from us. Our names can be taken out of the book of life. We can receive a severe punishment if we continually sin against God and don't do anything about it. And it might just be the case that one of us here tonight is in that situation. Uh, and let me tell you, if it's a private thing and, and you don't feel like telling us, that's okay. Tell God about it. Ask Him for help because He can help you. His Word can lead you and guide you in ways that we just can't do ourselves. But if it's something you're struggling with, maybe it's a public sin, maybe it's still a private sin, you need our prayers, you need our comfort, you need our, our encouragement, we'd be happy to give it to you. In fact, I'm not going to judge you. If you're struggling with sin... I'm going to be the last to cast the stone because I, I struggle with sin too. So let us help you. But maybe it's the case tonight you are a Christ, or not a Christian and you've not obeyed the gospel yet. We're told in 2 Thessalonians that one day he's coming back in vengeance and flaming fire with his holy angels to deal retribution to those who do not know God and those who have not obeyed the gospel. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9 says that he is the eternal or he is the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey Him. You need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ by believing in Him as the Son of God, confessing Him as the Lord, by repenting of your sins, and being baptized in order for your sins to be washed away by the blood of Christ. If anyone here tonight needs to obey the gospel or make things right with God again, why don't you come forward while we stand and while we sing. What will you do with Jesus? The question comes to you. And you must give an answer for something you must do. What shall it be? What shall it be? What shall your answer be? What will you do with Jesus? Oh, what shall your answer be? What will you do with Jesus? It comes by night and day. With pierced hands uplifted, He waits, what will you say? What shall it be? What shall it be? What shall your answer be? What will you do with Jesus? Oh, what shall your answer be? What will you do with Jesus? He's knocking at the door. Refuse him so no longer, lest he should plead no more. What shall it be? What shall it be? What shall your answer be? What will you do with Jesus? Oh, what shall your answer be? The Lord's table is still prepared for those and unable to partake this morning. If you'll take the front seat, you'll be served. This still being the first day of the week, the table has been left prepared for those of our number who could not be here this morning to take the opportunity to remember the greatest act of love that was ever shown, and that the Father in heaven gave up the best of heaven 
and sent his son here to die for us. We need to look back at the cross and think about that sacrifice and what it means to each and every one of us partake of these emblems in a worthy and pleasing manner. Would you bow with me, please? We offer our thanks now, Father, for this, the bread which fittingly represents the body of Jesus that was sacrificed on Calvary's cross. We pray, Father, that as we partake of it, we do so in a manner that is worthy and pleasing unto thee. We're thankful, Father, for the love that you've shown for us. And it's through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We offer our thanks now, Father, for this, the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that Jesus shed on Calvary for us. We know, Father, without the shedding of that blood, we have no remission of sins. We pray now, Father, that we take of it in a manner that is worthy and pleasing. It's through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. brings to close the communion part of our service but we have another opportunity now to lay by in store and give back to our father what he has so richly blessed us with would you bow with me we come unto you father thanking thee for all the blessings of life knowing father that all that we have comes from thee we ask you to be with this offering that we extend back to thee father knowing that this congregation will use it in a wise manner and use it for the spreading of your word. Be with the elders as they distribute these funds, if they do so according to your will. We ask these favors and blessings in Jesus' precious name. Amen. This brings to a close the services for this evening. I'm sure we can all say it's been good to be here. Luke, pretty tough question and answers there. But you did a good job. We appreciate that. Remember Bible study Wednesday evening. Come prepared. If nothing need further be said, would the one who dismisses please come forward. Heavenly Father, we're indeed thankful for this day that you bless us with another opportunity that we can come out and hear a portion of your word. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would be with us this week as we leave this place and as we study our Bibles, that we would search and follow up on these questions, that we might find the answers that we're looking for, and that they would all be in accordance with your will. Well, we know that the answer is there if we just keep looking. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon the sick. We pray, Heavenly Father, this day for Kenny, for Christy Groves, and we thank you for Kevin Dixon and Sarah, that you would be with them and bless them, and for Ruth, and for all the many Don Bunn Gardeners, and for the many more that was listed in our book. We ask your blessing is upon them. Go with us as we depart this place, and watch over us and keep us safe, and bring us back again at the next appointed time. We ask it in your Son's name, Jesus. Amen.